So I, most of you who have been with, uh, with Trout Unlimited for a while know that we are actually not a fishing organization. We love to fish and our love of fishing, or at least this is what's happened for most of us, our love for cold water fish, trout and salmon uh, has brought us to a desire to conserve, protect and restore cold water resources. And so we really are a kind of a conservation and education organization composed of people who love to fish. Uh, I think you may know that uh, Trout Unlimited is actually a nationwide organization with over 300 chapters and uh, several hundred thousand members. And as I understand it, the Twin Cities chapter is one of the five largest chapters in the country. I've heard that we're the second biggest. I've heard we're the fifth biggest. I don't know what the truth is. The only truth, the only thing I know is true is that the Guadalupe chapter in Texas is the biggest chapter because they're from Texas. They're the only chapter in Texas too, but we love them because they have actually donated money to uh, trout stream projects in the upper Midwest. Uh, we really focus on four key areas at Trout Unlimited. Uh, we work on advocacy for sensible environmental policies. We generally, although not always, take more of a non-confrontational approach to try to work with people, uh, with landowners, farmers, uh, uh, resource companies and so forth to come up with good solutions for protecting uh, trout streams. Uh, we're probably best known for uh, habitat improvement projects. And I'm sure many of you in this room or out in Zoom land have been on one of our habitat projects. We just a couple of weeks ago uh, on a very cold Saturday, uh, we were out at Eagle Creek cutting buckthorn. Uh, and uh, we cleared about an acre. You could see uh, down, down in the stream valley where a previous project had, had taken place and it's really grown into nice native vegetation. And uh, anyway, this is a big area of focus for, for Trout Unlimited and something that we're very proud of. Uh, we're big on engagement and engagement means that we like to socialize, we like to fish together and we like to have chapter meetings like this one. Uh, and then finally, I, we really focus a lot on education. And I think that education is a really important um, area for the Twin Cities chapter, uh, because if you haven't noticed, uh, we have kind of like the seven county metro area in our chapter. We do have some great trout streams that Mark is gonna talk about, but we do not have as many trout streams as those people up on the North shore or down in uh, Southeast Minnesota or across the river in Wisconsin. Uh, we have a lot less streams than they do, but we have way, way more kids. And so I, I really want us to, to paraphrase a former president, I want us to be the education chapter. And uh, we've really been working uh, uh, well with the Trout in the Classroom program uh, with the, the state council. Uh, last month, we did a whole bunch of fly tying programs in schools. Pretty soon we're gonna have the releases for the trout in the classroom trout. And you will soon get an email talking about uh, uh, potentially volunteering to go help kids release trout into the streams that they've been raising. Uh, you've probably already seen an email about the 30 programs that we have going on this summer for teaching kids and families to fish, uh, both uh, in warm water and also some, some actual trout streams. I, and uh, one thing that I'm particularly excited about is that after a two year break because of COVID, uh, we are bringing back the Foster the Outdoors program, which is a one-on-one -on -one mentoring opportunity. And I, uh, it's a, 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 I, I haven't done it myself, but I've talked with several members who uh, said that it was just really a life-changing experience to work one-on-one -on -one with a, uh, a, uh, a youth and their guardian, guardian, excuse me, to take them fishing. And uh, we'll actually uh, soon be having a mentor mentee meetup for Foster the Outdoors. I think it happens on May 21st. You will get an email about that. Uh, but we also happen to have Rich Femling right there, who's one of the two co-chairs for that Foster the Outdoors program.
Uh, so if you do have any questions or are interested in Foster the Outdoors and you want to hear straight from the horse's mouth what it's like, uh, please track down Rich after the meeting. I, another thing that we've been working very hard on is collaborating with our sister chapter, Kiaptowish, over in Wisconsin, uh, to restore the Kinnikinnick River. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have fished on that stream, and it is just an amazing cold water resource. Uh, 45 minutes drive away from a city of 3 million people. Uh, I was fishing it uh, in the lower Kinney Canyon uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, with a friend who um, owns some property there. And we saw two fishers, which are those, you know, large weasel-like, you know, critters that I thought only lived in far northern Minnesota or Canada, but apparently after being exterminated, they've made their way down and have colonized the Kinnikinnick River. I mean, it's just, even if you don't love trout fishing and it's got amazing trout fishing, it's just a, a, a fabulous place. And we have a kind of a once in a generation opportunity to remove the two dams, the two remaining dams that are in Powell Falls to reconnect the river to reduce the summertime water temperatures in the lower river because those uh, reservoirs behind the dams have kind of silted in and uh, you know are basically just a heat source so we can lower those temperatures. We can control the silt built up. And also there's something like a, a, a mile of prime trout stream, uh, which is had been covered by this Lake Louise impoundment, which is now opened up. And we can restore that stream and just have this terrific trout stream flowing through downtown River Falls. Uh, so I'm sure you probably, uh, you know, received emails, heard about it before. Uh, a, we're getting public funding for about two thirds of the Powell Falls removal and restoration. And that public funding will recover, will cover taking out the dam, getting rid of the structures, reinforcing whatever structures are needed and doing some basic soil stabilization. Uh, but we need about a million more dollars to really do uh, you know, a comprehensive habitat project there uh, to completely uh, protect that part from erosion, uh, seed the banks uh, with native vegetation and really turn it into a great trout stream. Uh, of that million dollars, uh, we're going to a variety of sources, but we're asking Trout Unlimited members and uh, trout fishing related businesses uh, to chip in about uh, $200,000. And of that $200,000, I was tasked with finding $30,000 between Twin Cities TU's chapter treasury and our members. And so we sent out an appeal uh, in the middle of March to all of you uh, asking for donations. I, oh, I should mention, by the way, I got a little carried away with my story. This uh, photo is from last week. You can actually see a small amount of daylight there. That's where the turbine in the Paul Falls Dam used to be, and they've already pulled out the turbine. And we were kind of wondering uh, who is gonna be the first kayaker who decides to try and go through there. <laughs> The current is pretty fast. <laughs> uh, you can also see uh, it's even worse further upstream, but you have these kind of high eroding banks that are dumping silt into the stream. Uh, so that project that we're considering, you know, will be all about getting equipment in there to, to level out the banks, um, allow the stream to reconnect with the floodplain, uh, and then get native vegetation in there so that it doesn't erode. But anyway, I was... Uh, I was going on with my story before I so rudely interrupted myself. I, I, we, I, we sent out an appeal in the middle of March asking uh, TCTU members uh, to donate $15,000. And then our chapter treasury would match that with a $15,000 matching contribution. And we actually achieved that goal three weeks later on April 6th. I, I, and uh, we decided, okay, guess that goal was a layup. So let's run up the score. Uh, can we get to $30,000? Uh, we revised the goal. And I just checked before coming to the meeting this evening. And as of right now, we're at $19,000. So we have $11,000 to go. 
Uh, the chapter match is still going to be fifteen thousand uh, dollars, but that funding really will help uh, the overall fundraising effort uh, and really make this Kinney restoration project a reality. Uh, so, uh, if you uh, have ever fished the Kinney, if you love the Kinney, or uh, if you actually believe what I'm saying, uh, please go to this website, uh, read a little bit more about the Kinney and consider donating. So anyway, let's get on to the main event. We have a big group tonight. So a couple of uh, things that uh, tend to work well is if you have a cell phone, put it on stun. Uh, just check myself. Uh, if you're on Zoom, if you could mute yourself for now, that would be great. And uh, I expect we're going to have uh, some good questions tonight. And typically what we found with these hybrid meetings is that we ask the people who are participating by Zoom to put their questions into the chat. Uh, once uh, uh, Mark finishes his presentation, I will then read those questions to Mark and he'll answer the questions. And then once we get through the Zoom questions, uh, then we'll turn it over to the in-person audience to ask any additional questions. And Mark has promised that he is willing to stay as long as it takes to answer everybody's questions. So uh, no time pressure. Uh, so uh, anyway, without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. I, and I wrote it down so that I wouldn't uh, wouldn't miss any of his accomplishments. Uh, Mark Namath is the Trout Stream Habitat Specialist for the DNR's Central Region Fisheries. He's been actively, actively involved in protecting and improving trout resources in the Twin Cities metro area. He's passionate about water quality, stream habitat, and trout. During his spare time, you're likely to find him fishing streams or pursuing upland birds with his family and friends. Mark has BS degrees in fisheries and wildlife management from the University of Minnesota and an MS, MS in biology from Tennessee Technological University. His research focused on stocked and wild trout in the South Fork of the Holston River. And if you're a Johnny Cash fan, you probably have heard of the Holston River. Before coming to Minnesota, Mark worked as the fishery biologist on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona, aiding the recovery of the Apache trout. So anyway, Mark has a great presentation for us tonight, and I am going to put Mark's presentation up on the screen and let him come up and deliver it to us. You're all, all set. Right, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, I don't know if you need that. I'll take that. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to be with you tonight. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here in person and, and also still kind of a hybrid uh, doing this online. Uh, but I think we talked um, maybe a little bit last year about potentially getting an update. It's been a couple of years on some of the Metro trout streams and all the more important these days to get that update and kind of factoring in gas prices being a little bit higher. Uh, maybe some information here today will be useful and maybe sh shaving a few miles off your trip and reminding you of a stream here in the metro area that you, you, you might wish to fish. And at least I hope this meeting maybe checks the box, uh, maybe an update on, on a local fishery in your chapter's area, or maybe even spurs you to, um, um, try wet aligning one of these streams this year. Most of these streams are probably uh, just kind of a caveat, are not your Southeast Minnesota or um, Western Wisconsin streams. Uh, the numbers of trout in these streams are sometimes fewer, um, oftentimes much fewer than those other streams. Uh, these streams in, in the metro area, um, you can still step in and often be within 20 or 30 minutes of your home. They'll offer a challenge, maybe a lesson, or maybe the memory of a trout cut right here in the metro area. 
I have an update on six or seven streams today, and uh, I hope you find this interesting or, or maybe learn something new about one of the streams in your area. Um, I have a little information on location, parking on some of these streams, maybe a population update from a recent survey, maybe some habitat work that's been uh, ongoing or occurring on these streams, as well as um, and uh, just, just a little reminder on some of the regulations. I know with the Southeast Minnesota, with the, um, the regulation changes in the Southeast, sometimes a lot of folks might think that change included the metro area. So just kind of an informational piece, I'll just kind of remind you of some of the regulations here in the metro area. And also there's, um, as, as some of them are different and some of them potentially may be changing sometime in the near future. Here is the seven county metro map, and I hope you're uh, familiar with the highways and the counties on this map and just kind of place maybe where you live or maybe where you work from with some of these streams uh, that are in the metro area and might be something you can kind of just figure out where you are and, and if one of these streams start an interest, at least you'll have maybe kind of a location on the map. And where we're going to start out today is um, we're going to start out in northern Washington County on Browns Creek. And Browns Creek, uh, which is different from many streams in the southeast, that it starts up in the upland areas, approximately 250 feet above the average water level of the St. Croix River. And instead of springs feeding and being the source of that stream, wetlands that typically get very warm in the summertime coalesce to form Browns Creeks up in the Browns Creek up in the headwaters. As it steps down those plateaus or the river flows down those plateaus, it intercepts more and more groundwater to where it actually is, um, it, it receives enough cold water that actually the stream is able to support trout. And typically, let's see if I can use a pointer here. Uh, maybe I'll just point to the screen if that's okay. Um, typically south of McCusick Road and east toward the St. Croix is where we typically are finding trout in the fall during our, our, our late season sampling. Anglers, uh, the yellow areas are easements and, or um, aquatic management areas that are accessible and open to the public. The sort of the light green area is Browns Creek Park. Uh, both areas are open for, for public fishing. Uh, anglers, one of the access points that anglers commonly use is off of Boone Road in 96. <laughs> They'll park their cars there. Sometimes that parking area may be full and people will park just a little further away and it's just a little longer walk than walk through that AMA and then down to the Browns Creek Gorge where you can uh, start either move upstream along the angler easement or stay in the stream and move down and fish toward the St. Croix. There's also areas within the park that you can access the more westerly portion of the AMA, uh, accessing, accessing it from the Browns Creek Trail as well as the park area that's open to public fishing. Uh, more recent history from the 1990s, Browns Creek has been stocked with a thousand yearling brown trout each year. It's been managed as a put and take fishery. Um, and from the 1980s to present, um, typically uh, we'll, we'll find an average of maybe a hundred or so brown trout per mile <laughs> remaining in the system uh, from, our, from our sampling. Um, during the more recent surveys from like 2015, 2016, uh, we started encountering more young of year brown trout in our samples, where typically prior to this, we did not see any or very few young of year brown trout. So one of the changes in our management of brown trout, Browns Creek, instead of stocking yearling brown trout each year, we transitioned in 2020 to stocking yearling rainbow trout. That will give us an opportunity to kind of follow the brown trout population as these younger year fish grow into adults and some of the adults continue to mature in that system will give a chance to follow, follow those fish as well as continuing the, the put and take fishery, but instead of using brown trout, using rainbow trout in that fishery. Uh, the stream tends to have very high angling pressure in the springtime. Um, and this angling pressure sort of decreases over the year, likely mirroring the abundance of trout in, beer, in Browns Creek. Um, again, on average, we typically are showing about a thousand trout per mile in the fall during our end of year samplings. And this year, 
kind of rather surprisingly in the Browns Creek Park area at that sampling station, we captured young of year rainbow trout. So we were kind of scratching our head a little bit going, did rainbow trout reproduce in Browns Creek? Or did we in the spring stock really small rainbow trout? Um, but, what, but what we've kind of figured out is um, the Trout in the Classroom program, it's the uh, Minnesota Trout Unlimited program where they're bringing uh, trout in the classrooms, children are learning about trout, trout habitat. Browns Creek Park is a release site. So these students release those trout in May and even in the fall, they were still swimming around and they were a part of our sample. <clears throat> the brown trout are reproducing? Uh, they are kind of, they're reproducing consistently, but they tend to be reproducing at rather low numbers. But, um, you know, in a way we're having that chance to follow them and at the same time, still sustaining that uh, put and take fishery that anglers have come to enjoy and um, uh, in, appreciate in the stream. And I also say this year too, um, instead of talk, typically we'll stock all the, the trout at one time. Uh, we're kind of breaking that up to kind of extend the season. So we, we stock brown trout uh, before the opener and we'll likely be stocking uh, another cohort of trout in there, kind of spreading the season and help, hopefully spreading the pressure out uh, where anglers can enjoy the fishing in the stream. Um, just to touch on regulations, and you know, it's one thing that we're often asked, and maybe part of it's due to the changes in the southeast, or as I mentioned earlier, people kind of think of the metro area as being part of the southeast. And I can imagine nothing could ruin a day of fishing, um, best intentions in mind, and you unknowingly head down to the stream and somehow you're not following the rules. Uh, and, and that's what kind of brings me to kind of just share this information with you. But statewide regulations on trout streams uh, managed as such, uh, they typically open uh, the Friday closest to April 15th. Uh, this year it's April 16th to September 30th. The limit is five trout combined with no more than one over 16 inches being in your creel. Another thing that sometimes can be kind of confusing on trout streams is um, on designated trout streams, they are closed to fishing outside of that April 16th to September 30th window. So if you were gonna go fishing for say, maybe Northern Pike in the stream, because it is a designated trout stream, it is, it is against the rules to fish in that stream. And that's primarily to, to protect um, trout nests or adult spawning, uh, spawning trout uh, during that time of the year. Uh, here, here's that map again. And I think we're gonna move a little further south in Southern Washington County. And we're gonna visit Trout Brook. Okay. And Trout Brook, and, and this stream may be new or maybe not the Trout Brook you thought we were initially gonna talk about. And, and that's, that's probably okay. Um, Trout Brook in Afton and Afton State Park and the Afton Alps area is the newly, is the newest designated trout stream in the metro area. And it was designated as a trout stream in 2018. The first survey on Trout Brook, I believe was in 1990. A second follow-up survey was done in 2000. And at that time, the stream thought uh, there, there was potential for trout uh, in that stream. Let's see here. Um, though the stream had a high sediment load, low flows, and potentially warm summer, storm, warm summer water temperatures. Even though in the fall, one trout was sampled and some other fish species that would typically identify a stream as cold water or having water quality um, that, um, that didn't have very many pollutants in that water. Um, what stirred the interest of a closer look at Trout Brook was due to some sediment in, sedimentation issues in Afton Alps and the uh, Afton State Park area. With the willingness of the Southern Washington County Watershed District, Afton Alps, uh, to understand more than just trying to um, put a Band-Aid on the problem, they allowed more time to kind of look at the stream and, and um, in its whole, so we could develop a better plan to sort of solve the problems that were causing the sediment sedimentation issues in the Afton Alps area, but at the same time, do things that are better for the stream and the 
um, the fish and the other animals that rely on that water. So uh, through that broader search, we've got to look at some of the issues that were causing some of the concerns from a fish habitat perspective. A lot of the pools have filled in with very fine sediments. And often these pools sometimes are two and a half and three feet deep, but they're completely filled with sand, limiting the amount of habitat in those waters. Uh, debris jams are common. These are, um, you know, they're kind of blocking up sediments. You get a big event, these blow out and these cascade a lot of sediments down into the Appen Alps area or in other areas where uh, they fill in the pools again. And finally, there were fish barriers. There was a portion of uh, Trout Brook that had been channelized. So we, we got a chance to look at these things and sort of develop a plan to address some of these issues with the stream and the ski resort in mind. Uh, in 2013, we collected some temperature data from the stream, as well as a fish survey. And the results of both these surveys um, with the cool water temperatures uh, gave an indication that the stream would likely be able to support trout, even brook trout. And some of the species in the stream were species that are intel intolerant to poor water quality, like log perch and cold water dependent species like eel pout and brook stickleback. But even with those species in the stream, at that time, we found a brook trout and several brown trout in the stream, and the stream had not been stocked before. From a wetter climate to graded storage and infiltration areas in the watershed, discharge in the stream had increased from 2004 to 2020. <clears throat> Instead of in 2004, we were seeing uh, discharge or, or flow in cubic feet per second between two and maybe two and a quarter feet per second. We're in 2020, we're seeing that discharge almost doubling to about four to four and a half cubic feet per second in the stream. This creates colder water, especially if that water is infiltrated and not coming off the highways. It also creates more living space for trout, other fish species and invertebrates in the stream. So from the 2013 surveys and work that began in the watershed from 2014 to 2016, we kind of think of that phase one uh, where primarily this work was done by hand, maybe moving the stream away from a, an eroding bank, removing some of these debris jams. We're in 2018, a uh, uh, project to re-meander a channelized portion of Trout Book back into its historic stream uh, location, as well as planning for phase three which will address some more erosion and habitat issues in the stream. And the goal of these projects are to increase connectivity from the St. Croix River all the way up to the north end of Afton Park, or yeah, Afton State Park, to improve water quality in one respect by reducing the amount of sediments that are entering the stream. And our goal is to reduce this by 75% or greater. So those pools and those riffles that are getting covered over with sand and sediments, especially in the upstream areas, that sand will be able to wash out and we'll have um, that really nice substrate as in trout book, again, available for the fish and the invertebrates. To increase uh, stream habitat, again, by moving the sand out of the system, adding woody debris to, this, to the stream. And it's also been proposed as a heritage brook trout stocking location. So we're very hopeful of having brook trout there sometime in the future. And we'll continue to monitor the stream, both the physical environment, as well as the biological environment in the stream. And if this has been a little interesting, and um, our most recent population sample was done in 2021, where in 2013, we captured about five trout in the first survey, and most of those were in the closest to the St. Croix River. In 2017, after some of the hand habitat work improvements were accomplished, we saw a slight increase in the abundance of trout from, from, to a, up, from five to up to about 31. And then on the last project, where a portion of the stream was re-meandered out into its historic channel location, we saw the abundance of trout increase to over 300 fish in Trout Brook. Um, most of the fish in the upper portion, site two, three, and four, those areas are still really filled in with sand. And most of those fish are young of your fish. There might've been a couple of adults out there maybe looking for spawning habitat, but most of the adult fish that we were seeing in the stream, and again, with young of your fish, was in the lower reach in Afton State Park 
in close proximity to the St. Croix River. If you are interested in maybe accessing that area, walking the stream, um, the best way to access Trout Brook, especially that, that southern area, is to drive through the state park. Um, you need a park sticker or a permit when you enter the park, but there's a two mile road that takes you to the parking area. It's an L kind of circles on that raft and there you, you can get out, park your car, kind of walk down a paved trail. And then it's still about a half a mile to the stream, kind of down a little bit of a hill. It's a little bit of a walk up, um, but likely you have rewards of visiting the, visiting the trail stream and maybe potentially having the opportunity to catch a brown <laughs> trout down there. And maybe later on, uh, uh, Minnesota Driftless or a Heritage Brook trout there. Okay. Uh, I guess the next group of streams we're kind of, kind of, kind of put together are the streams focused around the Vermilion River in, in central Dakota County. That's South Creek, the Vermilion River, and the area that many TCTU chapter members have been involved with in the last several years is the south branch of the Vermilion River. Less than 30 miles from the heart of the heart of the Twin Cities, this unique and popular trout resource is available for the public. The Vermilion River, the south branch of the Vermilion and South Creek present opportunities for a trophy brown trout fishery in close proximity to the metro area. It is also stocked with rainbow trout each year, presenting a couple different opportunities to catch fish. Uh, on this map, and there's a map in the back as well, uh, the yellow areas are aquatic management areas, the purple areas are wildlife management areas, and the red areas are uh, city, county, or um, township property that's also open to the public. So approximately the 19 and a half miles as a crow flies of this system, about 10 miles are in public ownership, providing plenty of opportunities, hopefully, for you to, out, to get out and enjoy some of these fishing opportunities. Uh, th this, this is the map that I have in the back, just kind of highlighting the parking locations associated with uh, the public land along the Vermilion River. Uh, the areas that, the parking areas that are circled in orange are the city and the county park lands. So on the south branch of the Vermilion River, Twin City Trout Unlimited chapter members have spent numerous days and hours removing buckthorn from the riparian area in preparation for a 2019 MNTU Lassard Sam's Ultra Heritage Program funded grant to improve stream habitat. And the work um, that you've done has benefited the stream, it's benefited the fish community, it's aided the fishability of the area and truly the longevity of the project. It was a lot of hard work, but it was also a lot of fun to be out there. And I could say you could walk the stream today and you'd probably be challenged to find more than just a few stems of buckthorn still growing along this, the stream. And I imagine with Steve as the uh, TCTU habitat chair, that buckthorn doesn't have much of a chance out there. Removing buckthorn from the riparian area of the stream uh, for this project, uh, took a river that was wide, shallow, had been filling in with sand. This project narrowed the stream, improved sediment transport, so uh, riffles, uh, pools became deeper, riffles became available for trout for spawning. Um, and it also added a lot of habitat for trout within that reach. And they treated over about, a th they treated over a mile of, of stream within that aquatic management area. What has this meant to the abundance of trout? Uh, we've collected a few data points and the, the black areas, and I apologize, they're probably a little hard to see in this room, uh, was a sample conducted before the habitat work began. And uh, statistically, the abundance in long-term monitoring stations bordering the South Branch of the Vermilion <laughs> River were identical to the short-term sampling stations that were set up in the, in the project area. In 2017, uh, following uh, a fair amount of buckthorn work, especially so focused around the center, center portion of the Vermilion River. We saw a little bit surprised, but we did see an increased abundance at the second station relative to the long-term monitoring station of more trout in the, in the south branch of the Vermilion River. Mm 
And finally, following that project, uh, the stream improvement project in 2019, you see a, a large improvement in the abundance of trout at the Castles 2 station, uh, slightly over 5,000 fish per mile, um, which was statistically different than the other uh, long-term monitoring stations. So it kind of gives you, even though it's just a few data points, it's kind of giving you an impression that, you know, uh, these projects are benefiting the stream and then and having an opportunity to improve the abundance of trout in those waters. Um, we'll continue looking at the habitat in the stream and continuing monitoring the population in the stream. And the next sample will be in 2023. Um, I, I think from talking to the conservation officers in and around the Vermilion River and from our opportunities to be walk, working out there late in the season, uh, we kind of have a sense that the uh, regulations around the Vermilion River are, are sort of, um, maybe not that well known. And just to review what the regulations are today, um, they, the season on the Vermilion River mm -hmm. opens in respect to the same time that the statewide regulations open. So this year would open on April 16th. However, the season extends to October 15th, kind of matching the, the stream regulations mm -hmm. in the, um, the Southeast part of Minnesota. Uh, it's catch and release only during the entire season for brown trout but statewide regulations for rainbow trout, which allows the harvest of rainbow trout from April 16th to September 14th. And then from September 15th to October 15th, that's catch and release only for all trout species. And I can understand where that can be a little bit confusing. Um, but um, we've heard this, we've heard from our conversation, conservation officers, we've heard from you. And we have proposed in a new rule package um, and this is something that I, I believe is not controversial. It needs to be approved by the legislature and it's not, it's not approved now, um, but we've asked that Dakota County be also included in the streams, the eight other counties in the Southeast to help reduce the confusion um, in the Vermilion River uh, to have those regulations be the same as they are in the Southeast. And I'm sure we'll stand communication in respect to um, if that's approved and, and what to expect as far as uh, that change. Uh, the next stream I think we're going to visit here real briefly is Trout Brook, and this is in southeastern Dakota County. And I only have a few slides here. Uh, this is one of the uh, Trout Brook location. It's a little south of Meeseville Ravine, a little northeast of Cannon Falls, um, and it's primarily in Meeseville Ravine Park. It's a county park. Uh, uh, there are still some private withholdings in the park and those are the areas in pink. Uh, but most of the stream is accessible via the Meesville Trail Road or 280 Street, which also turns into Orlando Trail. There's a parking area that, um, that you can step in and move upstream and enjoy your fishing there. Uh, both MNTU, the TCTU chapter, Dakota Parks have been active and improving habitat in the stream. This is just a slide of some habitat work that Dakota County Parks have been involved with stabilizing, stabilizing the banks. Uh, just south of the Meesville Trail, uh, some of you may have fished it, um, the MNTU trout project there, and I do believe they have a proposal to continue that work further downstream in the near future. Um, I have a couple slides with, uh, from the long-term monitoring station on Trout Brook. Uh, this is a, a brook trout slide, and it shows the abundance of brook trout. And in 2021, the number of adult and young of your brook trout was nearly similar with about 900 of each in the, in the stream on the long-term monitoring station. And that's 900 adult brook trout and 900 young of your brook trout per mile estimated from that station. Uh, brook trout were introduced to trout brook uh, through fingerling stockings in 1978, 1979. It received a fry stocking in 1983. And since then, it's been maintaining the brook trout population in Trout Brook. Uh, this is uh, the brown trout slide. And we began monitoring the brown trout population in the long-term monitoring station beginning in 2005. And we found the abundance of brown trout likely coming up from the Cannon River. Cannon River was between a nine adults and about 25 young of year fish each year. 
but in, from 2017 up to 221, we start seeing an increased variability mm -hmm. in the abundance of brown trout uh, in Trout Brook. And in 2021, our the long-term monitoring station, the sample had about 1,100 adult, adult brown trout and about 1,500 young of your brown trout estimated per mile in the system. Uh, again, uh, Trout Brook is, is just a short distance here from the Twin Cities. It sets you in a beautiful valley for, for angling. And just know that this is not a place to hunker down to a, a big rain event. Um, it washes out roads, it's washed out bridges, and it can gently lay a 50 foot cottonwood tree on a pedestrian path over the stream. So it's definitely a place where, um, because of this large watershed and the steep valley, um, you know, just be cautious when you're in there fishing and it's rained a lot. Um, uh, Trout Brook is currently managed as statewide regulations. That's a September 16th to September 30th, one fish over 16. Um, but if the regulations would change so that Dakota County would also be included in the Southeast counties, uh, this, this river would be uh, open to fishing from January 1st to this year, April 15th. Then you would have the, uh, the regulations from April 16th to September 15th where you could harvest fish. And then that extended opportunity to do fishing later in the season from September 15th to October 15th, but it would have to be catch and release. I think the last um, slide I put in today, or the last stream I put in today, was Eagle Creek. Um, this, this is the last trout stream in Scout County. And um, this is something that, a stream that Eagle Creek and the TCTU chapter have a history uh, dating back to the early 90s. And this chapter was uh, in large part a champion for Eagle Creek as the surrounding area around the stream had been uh, purchased for development. Eagle Creek or Twin City Trout Unlimited sort of rose to the challenge and uh, worked together to protect uh, a corridor around Eagle Creek so that that resource could be protected into the future. Uh, let's see. It's a trout stream with very cold water, very clear water, and it is spring fed. It's also on a outwashed sand plain. So now, does it have great water quality? It does have a very sandy stream uh, area. Um, this stream was last stocked in 1978 with brown trout. And from 1996 to 2019, it's had a low abundance uh, brown trout uh, in the river and populations have ranged from about 300 trout per mile to about 100 or, or less than 100 trout per mile. And in 2019, our survey was showing sort of on the lesser side of 100 trout per mile in the stream. Uh, this is an image of Eagle Creek. Uh, it's Most of it's located in the city of Savage. Uh, there's a, approximately a 200 foot border around the 2.9 miles of trout stream. And as you cross Highway 101, it actually enters the Minnesota National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, this land has remnant prairie and oak savanna type habitats. Um, it was able to be sort of separated from its watershed to protect the water quality, but it has some very large springs called boiling springs that deliver a lot of the stream flow to the stream. It's um, statewide rules in respect to fishing, but it's catch and release only for all trout. Uh, TCTU held a recent Habitat Day uh, with volunteers, and I think Bob mentioned a very cold day. I think someone told me the temperature, the wind chill was either three above or three below that day. So, you know, it was a kind of a cold day to be out on the stream. But thanks to Steve again. Um, he did a great job of organizing and make sure it ran really smoothly. But we had over 50 volunteers, I believe, out there. Uh, removing buckthorn and red cedars from the riparian area of the stream. And this is kind of a before and after picture where the area that says before is what it looked like an area that's inundated with buckthorn, bush honeysuckle and red cedar. Uh, removing those trees, the volunteers seeded it with native prairie grasses and a cover crop. So hopefully that will begin the process of bringing prairie back to that site, doing a better job of stabilizing the soils, buffering the stream from nu nutrients and hopefully improving the habitat for, for trout and trout fishing in that stream. It was a lot of work, but 
but it was, it was, it was a fun day. It kind of warmed up by the end. Okay. Uh, this is a look upstream. Uh, TCTU had started some habitat work a few years earlier. We kind of had to take a little bit COVID break, um, but that's kind of the opening up of the, the east branch of Eagle Creek in that stream corridor. Kind of looks like a nice place to fish. Uh, to maybe address some of the issues in respect to having a low, a low abundance of brown trout, this has also been proposed as uh, Minnesota Heritage or Minnesota Driftless, they're the, kind of the same, uh, brook trout stocking. And we were fortunate this fall that uh, brook trout in the hatchery started to grow and they needed a little more room. Uh, so we had the opportunity to take about 200 of those brook trout and stock them in the Eagle Creek this fall. Um, <coughs> So we hope that they're able to support a higher abundance of trout. They possibly can be more adapted to the stream conditions and hopefully provide more opportunities uh, for anglers to also fish in that stream for them. Here, here's a map of access locations and I do have copies in the back. Um, sites one, three, and four have some public parking spaces uh, that you can get out and explore the stream. Uh, area two is primarily a walk-in site and then there's not a lot of public parking around that area. Uh, so last, um, this year we had some help from John Lace and Pat Sexton. They were able to help out on a couple of trout samples um, on Ice Creek and on Trout Brook. And it's really enjoyable to have TC2 members out there sort of um, you know, kind of seeing the fishery part of the habitat work that's being conducted. And uh, others have joined us on the south branch of the Vermilion River. And I hope this is something that we can continue to do. And I'll let John and uh, Pat let you know if they had a good time, but um, I, out there. But we really appreciated the help. And hopefully this year, uh, it may find you uh, visiting a stream of your youth or possibly casting a line into a new stream um, this year. Um, you know, maybe you might encounter a, a trophy brown trout on one of these fishing trips, uh, maybe a brace of uh, rainbow trout that you might bring home for dinner, as well as maybe having that opportunity to catch a heritage brook trout uh, right here in the Twin Cities close to where we live. So thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. I'm going to try to see how we can make this thing work with questions. I, I'm i going to stand next to this speaker. Okay. I have Zoom here too, but if I, um, if I turn my, if I turn my audio on, then it messes things up. So, um, so I guess we'll try to both okay. stand close to the speaker here. Uh, and uh, questions are starting to come in. Uh, from our Zoom audience. And the first question is from Paul Johnson. Who's and, that guy? And who's that? Yeah, who's Paul Johnson? And before I forget, uh, Paul Johnson is the treasurer of our chapter, and he's also an extremely accomplished fly tire. And he has tied up a box of flies that will be given to one of you. If you signed up to attend this meeting, you'll be entered into a drawing. And to save time, we're not going to announce the results of the drawing right now. We will do a random number selection. But one of you will uh, win a box of flies from Paul Johnson, also known as the Waconia Fly Company. But at any rate, uh, Paul's question is whether all the streams in your presentation uh, historically did have brook trout in them. Um. I would say definitively, I probably don't know the answer to that. Um, the Vermilion River um, had brook trout in it in the early 1890s, but they're still, because of the Hastings facing falls, they're not sure if they were introduced and we don't have any trout from that period. So we just, we just don't know. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess I really don't know. Um, if, if trout, we have records of trout being in the 1890s in some of these streams, but we don't know if they were naturally or placed there by, um, by settlers that came into Minnesota. Um, so yeah, sorry, I don't know the answer for that. All right, you've been okay. stumped. Okay. Well, there's a good question anyways. 
Okay, the next question is, uh, does Pine Creek near Trout Brook in Dakota County, this is from Daniel Owens, does that have any public access? I think Pachyderm Studios, where Nirvana recorded an album are on that street. Yes, um, I, I think public access to Pine Creek is very limited. Um, and I'm aware of Pachyderm Studios and there's a, a bridge down there um, that we've had discussions with them about moving them out and improving the trout habitat within Pine Creek, but they would probably fund most of the costs themselves and that would area would still remain private. But hopefully some of those actions, uh, they will undertake cooperatively and that will likely improve conditions in that in Pine Creek. Okay. okay. Uh, the next question, I'm just getting close to the, okay. to the speaker here. Uh, is Browns Creek, uh, I'm sorry, this question is from Jarrett Vanderwall. Is Browns Creek threatened by the surrounding residences and golf courses, or is the buffer zone around the creek sufficient to screen out contaminants? Well, I, I would say there's always challenges in our watershed, um, but we're fortunate, and these are some of the things I, I'm really happy to have that opportunity to mention, is that uh, water, the Browns Creek Watershed District um, and large parts of that community are very protective of that stream. And development does occur, but they still look for the best ways to infiltrate water, to have it return to the stream as groundwater and to protect that stream. And there's that line kind of moves back and forth as far as where we're finding trout that might be based on, based on uh, lower flow conditions, uh, maybe warmer weather, lower flow in the winter time. Um, but even though there's development in the watershed, I would say an enormous part of that watershed are partners in protecting uh, and infiltrating water so that it gets to the stream in the least harmful way possible. But the, as a watershed does grow and develop, uh, you, it's probably difficult to control all those inputs, but there's a very pro but I just mean there's a very proactive watershed district out there that's helping protect the stream. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Tony Cushion, excuse me, Tony Kuhn. I'm sorry, I have to take off my glasses to read it. Uh, it says, uh, is the U of M research area still on Trout Book or Valley Creek in Afton? I fished there as a youth in the 1960s, then it went almost entirely private. Um, there are some university in Minnesota research stations on Civil, Sil Silver Creek. And I believe there's another creek that are further up in Washington County where they still have research stations. Um, Valley Creek um, does occasionally have sampling done by the University of Minnesota. Uh, typically that would be a grad student or something like that. Um, but that's kind of, um, that's up to the, the, the landowners uh, within that watershed or along that stream corridor. Okay, so as I understand it, Valley Creek currently does not have any public access. Is that correct? It doesn't have, it doesn't have any public access. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Rick uh, Eller. Will streams that nearly dried up last year, like Spring Creek, have a recovery of trout? Um, I, I would say yes. Trout are fairly resilient. They're used to having disturbances, flood events. Their population will get low. Uh, they're species that are adapted and they recover quickly and will likely see those populations return as the water levels and uh, those conditions return. So I, I think it's typically for trout populations and maybe even in the trout brook um, scenarios, you'll see those dramatic up and downs on an annual or sometimes biannual basis um, of those trout populations. You might have a large adult population, a small young of your population, and then those things sort of uh, cycle back and forth. Okay, and another question from Tony Kuhn. Uh, any study info available on Mill Pond Stream, William O'Brien, or Lawrence Creek in Freconia? Uh, I know the Hinkley area, they're the ones that are in charge of Lawrence Creek, and they do some sampling on Lawrence Creek looking at that patrol population, uh, but most of that stream is again private. And then William O'Brien, um, a habitat project was done there um, probably in the early 2000s, maybe the late 1990s. Uh, portions of that are open. 
uh, for public fishing. I'm not sure when it was last surveyed, um, but I do remember um, when I visited the stream, seeing brook trout in the fall uh, swimming around in the channel. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, we may get more questions on Zoom, but we don't have any questions on Zoom okay. right now. So I'd like to open it up to uh, our in-person audience. Uh, has, has there been anything uh, as far as population studies looked at with like Nine Mile? Uh, Nine Mile in Bloomington? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe you want to repeat the question okay, so that the Zoom people can hear them. Uh, the question was about Nine Mile Creek and maybe trout population surveys on that stream. Um, it, from what am I understanding, historically, that stream had trout in it. Um, when the watershed in Bloomington developed, the Nine Mile Creek watershed, we probably didn't have the, the practices today that uh, can protect water quality. So when it was developed, a lot of water was just shunted right into the stream and that changed uh, the water quality where you get warmer temperatures. Mm -hmm. And typically that, in that kind of the scenario, the stream is no longer able to support trout. Um, I don't believe any recent surveys have been completed on Browns Creek, but kind of having an understanding in the watershed, I find it very un unlikely that trout would be in that stream today. Yes? Question, can you comment on Bell Creek and uh, Goodhue County? Uh, comment on Bell Creek and Goodhue County? Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have, uh, I, I guess I'm not that familiar with Bell Creek, so I'm sorry. I, I've, I've been on it before, but I just don't have any, uh, I don't personally don't have any, you know, I guess knowledge on that beyond a fishing trip out there. Mark, as I understand it, the, uh, the DNR office in Lake City is responsible for Goodhue County? Yes. yes. So if you do have a question, I can tell you right now, DNR people are unbelievably accessible. Uh, and the folks down in Lake City are great. So if you want to look them up and ask them about it, uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to give you some information. And then please pass it on to me too, because I've heard some stories. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can... I, I can connect you with uh, the area manager down there, provide you with his number and you can give him a call and, and I'm sure he'll be able to uh, provide you the information that you're, you're interested in there. So thanks. Yes. So it's used to melt ice and snow on high roads in the wintertime. Are there long-term, do we know, is there more salt coming into our streams in April uh, than there were? 40, 50 years ago? Uh, uh, I, I, I would say it's definitely a concern. And I think as our roadways increase, we're seeing more use of salt on those. I know a lot of communities are looking at ways to reduce the amount of salt, knowing that it impacts to wetlands, to lakes, to rivers and streams. Uh, we, do, we are doing some monitoring in respect to salt, at least uh, uh, fisheries are, we are seeing some salt concentrations increase in some of our streams. Um, and it's definitely a concern, but it's kind of a balance with public safety. Um, but it is something that, that, you know, there's awareness of it and there's an interest in reducing how much salt we use on our landscape because we know it's entering our water. Um, like even just our water softeners deliver water to the waste treatment facility. They clean it up, but they don't get rid of the salt and the salt moves out, you know, you know it's flushed out in the rivers. So what we are seeing, uh, you know, that's just another avenue for salt entering our streams and that's a concern okay sorry joe so mark i can't remember but i want to say that i read somewhere that there's a study that says that uh trout population and uh, trout brook and Eastville okay is its own genetically distinct population is that could you uh, um, I, again I, I probably uh, the, the question was about the trout in Misville ravine uh, being an isolated or a sole population or a unique population and I would probably have to confer uh, defer to uh, the lake city manager uh, he would know more about that than I, than I do and I'm sorry I don't have the answer to that so Mark, I, I actually did ask the guys okay, down great. in Lake City that question. Uh, and the answer is that those trout 
uh, were taken from Rice Creek, which flowed into Northfield. Uh, flows in at uh, the cannon at Northfield. And the thought at the time was that the Rice Creek trout were a heritage strain right. of brook trout. And so they thought, you know, they get the Minnesota heritage. And then after stocking the stream, they found out that actually those trout in Rice Creek came from a stocking from New Hampshire. <laughs> so they've had to kind of redo the heritage brook trout program in Minnesota. But yeah. Anyway, those 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 brook trout and trout brook, they're wonderful brook trout uh, immigrants from New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Mark, I got okay. Um, the vermilion. Yeah. Did the PCA deem that a warm water stream, or or is it now a cold water stream? It it's um, it's still a cold water stream. There are portions uh, that are mm. yeah. Or warm water. It there's warm water portions of the Vermilion River. There's cold water portions of the Vermilion River, and as it flows towards Hastings again, it becomes a warm water river. Uh, so, but the the designated trout portion of the Vermilion River is um, uh, we measure uh, sort of the habitat quality there or the fish communities based on a southeastern Minnesota uh, index of biotic integrity. Using that. Uh, to help us measure the health of the stream by just looking at the fish community. Can I ask one last question? Sure. <laughs> right. Okay. So now let's go to brook trout in Apple. So they're not there yet, but they've been proposed to be placed there. Okay. So was did I understand that right? It is the kind of the thinking that if you restore the headwaters, that it's going to help the portion of the stream in Apple State Park itself. Um, Uh, in Trout Brook, uh, could you could you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. It's um, okay. So, so when you were describing restoration efforts, um, okay. Trout, Trout Brook. Trout Brook. Thank you. It sounded like there wasn't any restoration effort within the state park itself. So, is the thought that if you restore the headwaters, that that will slowly over time improve the quality of the stream in the state park? Um, okay. In, in Trout Brook, um, that the different phases are addressing both portions in Afton State Park, as well as in the ski area, uh, looking at it, uh, you know, from a stream health perspective. And, and again, this is where Southern Washington, Southern Washington County Conservation District comes in, as they've been very active in uh, shoring up areas where sediment was entering the stream. So much of the sediment load that's entering the stream, at least from outside of the park, is historic, uh, an historic bed load that's moving through the stream. And areas that had been uh, delivering a lot of sediment to the stream have now uh, more recently been patched up where the stream's been moved from those banks to reduce the amount of sediment coming into the stream. Yes. You had mentioned that uh, a number of streams have been in stockings throughout the year. Do you know how frequently the south branch of the Vermilion uh, uh, The question was about how often the Vermilion River, the south branch of the Vermilion River, are being stocked with rainbow trout. Uh, typically, they're being stocked about three times a year. And as water temperatures warm in the Vermilion River system, we're kind of limited to stock beyond. Um, uh, but beyond Memorial Day. So typically our, our two or three stockings on the Vermilion River are gonna occur a little bit for, for the opener. So those fish have a chance to acclimate for when the season opens. Uh, we're probably gonna wait a couple of weeks, have the opportunity to stock the stream again. Again, kind of spreading out the system or spreading out the season and hopefully keeping the catchability of rainbow trout uh, uh, kind of elevated in the stream instead of just them all disappearing right away. And then likely uh, there will be another opportunity to stop the, stock the stream again, probably closer to Labor Day. And depending on water temperatures, uh, it, it might be in the colder portions of the stream that, um, or it might be a broader stocking if the weather is cool enough, because we definitely look at temperatures before releasing the fish. And as you mentioned, the South Branch, the Vermilion River, that's one of the colder stretches. Uh, so that's one that often will be stocked later in the season.
Yes. You know the regulations below the falls on the vermilion? Uh, no, I don't. I'm just curious if, you, if it was all catching down trout below the falls. Um, the, the regulations essentially stop uh, for trout stream regulations at 1.1 miles east of Highway 52. Okay. Uh, so if you do catch a trout outside of the designated trout portion, you're able to harvest that trout. Um, just so even if it's a brown trout, even if it's a large brown trout, you can harvest that trout uh, just so it's within the season dates uh, because it's not protected in that area. Uh, but that, that's something uh, we're having conversations about with our conservation officers mm -hmm. and, and that those fish move back and forth into the designated area and then they move out toward Hastings. And, you know, we're just, uh, we're hearing from some anglers uh, that they're concerned about the harvest in that portion of the stream. So it's mm -hmm. just something uh, that we're thinking about. And I believe the East Metro Fisheries will be having an open house uh, later in 2022 to talk about that situation with the anglers and see what, uh, what you folks and other anglers think about um, maybe changing the regulation on that portion of the stream, not changing the designation, but maybe changing the regulation. Have they done sampling west of 52 or uh, east of 52 rather? Um, on very limited. And I would imagine that sampling was back in the 1990s okay. when they were looking more at the extent of how far the cold water habitat was in the Vermilion River. I know occasionally we do some fish testing down there, collecting northern pike, white suckers, uh, to determine the contaminants that those fish have. Uh, but our sampling down there, at least in, in my time, since about uh, 2012 or 13 here in the metro area, it's just been limited to the MPCA or DNR collecting fish there to look at uh, contaminants in those fish. So. Looks like you're not really keeping track of the, the population of trout right. down there. No. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple of more online questions. Um, feel free to keep the questions going here too, but I thought I'd ask him while I'm at it. Um, Gary Moore wants to know if any of the lakes in Lebanon Hills Park are still stocked with trout. I don't believe I don't believe they are. <laughs> um, in the metro area, the stream the streams that were either stocking for winter trout fishing or summer trout fishing. Uh, in the winter, it's Quarry Lake, Holland Lake, Seneco Lake, Courthouse Lake here in the metro area. And in the summertime, we're stocking Quarry Lake and Courthouse Lake uh, for summertime fishing, I believe. And Quarry Lake, I'm not sure if anyone's visited Quarry Lake. It's probably about 75 acres in size. It's in the city of Shakopee. <clears throat> It has about a 50 foot depth. It was a kind of a, a quarry uh, that mining had stopped. Uh, it's only available for shoreline access, but it, it's really, a, you'll see people out there all year long or in the wintertime, ice fishing out on the water. And I believe the West Metro typically stocks about 14,000 rainbow trout and brown trout into Quarry Lake. And it's maybe different from Courthouse or Seneco in that those just the number of fish and the amount of area, those fish stay in there for a long time. And you'll see anglers out throughout the winter and anglers also enjoying that, that fishery in the springtime as well. Kind of. No kayaks. No, no kayaks. kayaks. Uh, I, it, yeah, no kayaks. Um, you will see like the Prior Lake, or I think they're now called the Shakopee Prior Lake Water Ski Club. Mm -hmm. They, in the development of that and making it a park access or a park property of the city of Shakopee, they acquired the water surface rights for a period of time from the quarry before the city of Shakopee owned the land surrounding it and are building a trout structure. So it's just, a, um, but the trout are stocked in there. The anglers have access to the periphery of that pond in the summertime, but in the wintertime, they have access to the, to the water surface or the frozen water surface. Yes. I don't know how long ago they stopped stocking uh, Square Lake. They, um, it, I don't know the exact date, um, but the East Metro Fisheries Manager TD, TJ debates of which probably many of you know, um, instead of like foregoing those fish and maybe having them go back to the hatchery and another source, he has maintained those fish in the East Metro area. And typically the Vermilion River was being stocked with about 6,000 trout annually. Uh, those fish, which were about 3,000 fish rainbow trout that were going to Square Lake are now going to the Vermilion River. So that resource 
is still here in the metro area, but instead of being in the lake, it's in the, uh, the Vermilion River. I know initially they went to Lake Elmo. Has that been successful at all? Um, they did go to Lake Elmo for a while. I just think uh, because of how warm the surface water gets, that those fish kind of get pinched down into a water, lower water level and they may not be as accessible to anglers because of that. So that's uh, one reason that initially they were stocked there and now they're being put into the Vermilion River as the access to those fish are probably is easier there than they are in Lake Elmo. Okay, a couple of more uh, questions from Zoom. Uh, one from Daniel Owens is, do any trout reside in the Cannon River year round or do they all need to go up to the cold water tributaries during the heat of summer? I, I would imagine the brown trout along the Cannon River, they might um, suck into those colder places uh, where the water is cooler, but there's likely refuges in the Cannon River that also support those trout, maybe lower around where groundwater is entering the stream. Um, but, but like what we're seeing in the St. Saint, the Saint Croix and Trout Brook, we're seeing fish move back and forth in the St. Croix River, and, and that's how we feel the the brook trout and brown trout are how, how they've introduced themselves into brown into trout brook. They swam over from the guinea. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so even though the taxes are higher, they still came over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then uh, another question is uh, from uh, Riggedy Bop. He's got the best, he or she have the best name. Uh, of any of the participants tonight. How large are the trout when you re release them into rivers like the Vermilion? Cool, cool. great question. And uh, it's a follow-up question is, does the DNR have a guess on how many get harvested per year? Um, I, um, in, in respect to harvest, I would imagine uh, maybe up to 75% of those fish are harvested. Typically like in 2020, when we did our most recent surveys, uh, on the South Branch, we're finding maybe 10 or 15, maybe up to 40 to 50 trout per mile in those samples. And what's kind of nice to know is those fish actually can even overwinter and anglers are again catching those fish. Um, but I would imagine the catch rate on those fish are pretty high. Um, for example, and yeah, I would say they're pretty high. And then from the hatchery, um, the, the rainbow trout stocked as yearling, it varies a little bit from year to year, but they're typically, between 10 inch and up to 12 inch fish that are stocked. And I think this year they were closer to about a half a pound each uh, when they were stocked in the Vermilion River. So there are fish that uh, you can catch and keep right um, um, soon after they're stocked. Okay, there's also been some chatter on Zoom about the Rice Creek chain of lakes purchasing a trout pond. It says they purchased a trout pond it's on planning maps. Did it ever get stocked? Anyway, and, do you know anything I'm not about sure a trout pond? No, I'm not Street sure where that is. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know about that. <laughs> don't know. Okay. Those guys on Zoom, they have all the cool information. So if anybody knows, um, maybe we can have some follow up or, Sorry, yeah. or something. Okay. In the Rice Creek, like a river, yeah. the St. Paul Watershed has Rice Creek. Not quite sure where where uh, what the reference. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll try to to find out more information about that, or um, uh, maybe uh, maybe somebody can 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 let us know. Paul Johnson says that all the cool kids are on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, I heard one uh, question. I've heard that trout were being stocked in Anoka County by the dam. Is that true? That would probably be Seneco Lake. Seneco Lake. And that's uh, yes. probably a, a most likely just a winter fishery. Okay. So, yep. And, and I have a question for you, okay. which you may not know, but I, I'll ask you anyway. Do you know if anybody's actually caught trout on Trout Brook in Afton State Park? Yes. People have um, caught them. I've, People have sent pictures uh, on occasion uh, fishing down by the St. Croix River 
and you know this is what my kid caught can you believe it is this so i have seen a few images of uh, brown trout being caught in a trout brook in afton darn i was hoping i could be the first but <laughs> I, guess, I guess those cool kids on zoom must have eaten yeah. Too yeah and it was a it was a young a young person with the fish um so yep. that's fabulous <laughs> any other questions for mark Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, well, thank you, Mark, for joining us tonight in person. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, Mark has provided his email address here, I believe, and his phone number. Uh, so if you have other questions, uh, if you don't want to give away any secrets, so you're afraid to ask the questions, you can ask Mark privately. Uh, I've always uh, said that the Twin Cities is the best, you know, million plus metro area anywhere in the country uh, to be from if you like to fish for trout. Uh, I think we have Denver and Seattle and all those places beat hands down. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have these great trout fishing opportunities like really, really close. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, some recognition should go to our chapter uh, for some of the great work that we've done in, in preserving and protecting and restoring those resources. And a lot of credit has to go to Mark and his friends at the DNR. So one more round of applause, please. Thank you. And we will see you next month. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>